So I'm very happy, honored and happy to be again with you, even in with this uh, particular mode. So I would like to report some about some old and more recent uh, results relating <coughs> the theory of linear cellular automata and linear subships on the one hand and group rings. Um, you recently hosted a remarkable talk about uh, the conjecture, the Kaplansky conjecture on unit conjecture, um, uh, units in uh, group rings. And here we will see some connections with another famous conjecture by Kaplansky. But first, let me set up the details of the, the notions and the setting. Okay, so I first want to discuss the notion of shifts or subshifts. So let G be a group in the <clears throat> in the language of symbolic dynamics, one refers to it as to the universe. We also fix a set A. So for the moment, and, and actually in general, in the whole talk, it will not be necessarily a finite set, which we call the alphabet. At least to make it interesting, we, we suppose it non-empty. Okay, then with these two ingredients, we build the so-called configuration space. So the set A to the power G, which is the set of all maps from G, from the universe, to A, to the alphabet. Okay, and we equip this set with the so-called pro-discrete uniform structure. Okay, so um, <clears throat> this is a, a refinement than just the so-called pro-discrete topology. But uh, what it is, so we, we, we give the discrete uh, uniform structure to each single factor here of this product. And then we take the product uniform structure. So uh, uniformity is given by the so-called entourage, which are um, neighborhoods of the diagonal in the Cartesian product of the space. So here, uh, a typical entourage, so the uh, basic entourage, is something of the form W of omega, so is this pair of configurations of these maps X and Y from G to A, which when omega is a finite subset of G, they coincide when restricted to this omega, okay? So this, the, the idea is that two configurations are close, they're close in this uh, uniform structure and, they're in, and therefore in the topology induced by it, they are close if they coincide on large finite subsets of G, okay? So I repeat W of omega, when omega runs over all finite subsets of G, define uh, the basic entourage of this uniform structure, okay? So this is the uniform structure and therefore the topology on this space. Then we also equip the configuration space with an action of the group G, which reminds you of the left regular representation. So X is a map, is an element in the, a, in the configuration space, A power G, G and H are group elements. So now GX is the new configuration, the one which is obtained by application of the group element G to the configuration X. And I define it by saying, declaring that its value at the H element of the group is nothing but the evaluation of X at the group element G inverse H, okay? So we have both um, this uniform structure and the action of G. And this, but from this we can define the a subshift, which is the title of this subsection, which is nothing but a G invariant, so invariant under the G shift, G invariant and closed, closed in the uh, topology given by the prodiscrete uniform structure, subset of the configuration space. So sigma, a G invariant closest subset of the configuration space is a subshift. 
And subshifts are the, the objects of uh, the category which we will study, we will consider which are the main object of uh, symbolic dynamics. Okay, typically symbolic dynamics is with G equal Z, the integers, but we will consider any general group, okay? So an important example of subshifts arise as follows. So we fix a finite subset of G, D. We also fix a subset of all maps from D to A. These are called patterns. So just uh, maps support with support defined on D. Here, the maps are defined of all G of the whole group. Here, we just consider maps defined of D. And we take a subset of these maps defined on D. And then we define the subshift sigma, which depends on D and P, as a set of all configurations such that whenever we act by the G shift, so we translate then with the shift, and we restrict them to D, this sort of window, then they fall in this subset P. So you should regard the D, which is called a memory set, as a window, and P as a is called a defining set of admissible patterns. What this means that you look, you move your window around, uh, cover with, um, you cover all the configuration except you have this small window open, and if what you see, the configuration which is a finite configuration. Uh, um, supported by D is uh, admissible, so belongs to this set P, then you accept your configuration, okay? So, and uh, so sigma DP is a set of all such accepted configurations. And in this case, sigma, the this is, it is easy to see that this is G invariant and it's close in the per discrete uh, topology. And this is called a subshift of finite type, okay? Good. Now I want to talk about the morphism of this category. The morphisms of this category are called cellular automata. They were, introduced and um, you know and uh, the, the first attempts to define cellular automata go back to uh, von Neumann and Stan Ulam because they wanted to um, to find a, a machine a device somehow creating life this was eventually uh, succeeded by by Conway, John Conway, with the game of life. But I think that already von Neumann had done it in a very complicated manner. But anyway, so cellular automata uh, uh, are now in, in our setting, we don't care about life. And we regard just as the, uh, the morphisms of this category. So what is a cellular automaton? A cellular automaton is a map from the self map of the configuration space, so from A power G to A power G, satisfying the following local condition, okay? So it exists a finite subset of G as before, finite subset, now I call it M, and the map mu from the set of patterns A to the power M to A, hmm, such that the following holds. How do we define tau of x? So x is a configuration. Tau of x is a new configuration, is the image of the configuration x by the map tau. So I have to tell you what is, this is a map from g to a. I have to tell you what is the element a associated with the group g. Okay, so what I do? So I act by g inverse, to the configuration X. This is the G shift. So this is just a new configuration, the translated of X by G inverse, okay? Then I restrict it to M, this fixed 
find a subset of G. Okay, this element here of the restriction is an element of the set of patterns A to the power M of all maps from M to A. Okay, but then I have this map mu and I apply it to this and I get an element in A. Okay, so this is the way we, we define a cellular automaton. So a cellular automaton is, is constructed by this simple way. Okay, so we again, you should think of M as a window which covers all the configuration except a small window which is given by M. And then whatever you look there, you have an element in this um, set of patterns, A to power M, and you apply the rule which is given by mu. Okay, so this is called the memory, and this is called the local defining map for tau. Okay, now when A is finite and then A to the power G is compact, there is a well known theorem, a celebrated theorem, which is called the Curtis Hedlund Lindon theorem, which asserts that just, uh, ma such a map tau is a cellular automaton if and only if, so it characterizes cellular automata as the maps from A power G to itself, which are G equivalent, so they commute with the G shift and continuous, continuous in the topology uh, given by the prediscrete topology, okay? Now in our setting, A is not supposed, as I mentioned, is not supposed to be finite. It is possibly infinite. And then with Michel, we have extended the Curtis Edlund Lindon. And the, this is why we consider the uniform pro discrete uh, structure. And then the characterization of cellular automata is that of maps, which are G equivalent. So they commute with the G shift, but are also uniformly continuous. Clearly, if A is finite, a to the power G is compact and any continuous map is uniformly continuous and this result reduces to the previous one. But in the, I repeat, in the general case, this is the, the curtis Hedlund theorem cannot be uh, applied, okay? Okay, and then this is just a notation, um, and so an observation CA, cellular automata, over the universe G and the alphabet A is just the set of all cellular automata from A power G to A power G. And it is uh, clear also because of this version of the Curtis Hedden Linton theorem that it is a monoid with composition of maps. The identity element is just the identity map from A power G to A power G. And uh, the fact that composition of cellular automata is still a composition a cellular automata follows from this characterization, for example, because the composition of G equivalent maps is G equivalent and composition of uniformly continuous maps is uniformly continuous. Okay, now I want to mention the 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 first, which is a, which is the the old result, which I mentioned. There are I'll, because this is, the, is, a, is a relation to the theory of group rings. So let me say, introduce this notation. A self map F from a set X to itself is called surjunctive. I think this, this term goes back to Hedlund. Actually, um, no, sorry, to, to Gottschalk. Gottschalk, if whenever it is injective, it is necessarily surjective, and therefore it is bijective. Okay, this this definition clearly more uh, should applies to a class of maps rather than to a single map. But anyway, let's see. For example, if X is a, is a finite set, it is clear that every self map is surjunctive in the sense that if it is injective it is clearly subjective and in fact, even vice versa. 
if x is a, a finite dimensional vector space over a field k, I repeat, so if x is a finite dimensional vector space over a field k, and f is a linear map, then it is surjective, it is surjunctive. We know that indeed any endomorphism of a finite dimensional vector space is injective if and only if indeed it is uh, surjective. Okay, there is, I didn't write down, there is another category for which this surjunctivity result holds, namely the category of um, algebraic varieties over uncountable um, algebraically closed fields. And the maps are uh, the, 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 the regular morphisms in algebraic geometry. And this is the famous Axe-Grothendieck theorem. Okay, much more involved than this first two observation. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, so now there is a, a, a definition which again goes, goes back to Gottschalk and one says that the group G is surjunctive if whenever one takes a finite alphabet A, so the, the set A now is finite, so the group G is surjunctive if whenever the alphabet set A is finite, then all cellular automata, so all maps from A power G to A power G are surjunctive. That is, if the cellular automata is injective, then necessarily is surjective. Okay. Okay, let's see a class. Uh, uh, let's see some e simple examples of surjunctive groups. Okay, when the group G is finite, this is uh, very clear. Why? Because in this case, the configuration space is finite because A is finite, G is finite, A power G is finite. So tau is just a self map of a finite set. And therefore, if it is injective, it is automatically subjective, no matter if it is a cellular automaton or not, okay? So this is clear. Residually finite. So the, the, the groups which are residually finite also are surjunctive. This was proved by Lawton. And the, and the way you prove it is just that you can characterize residual finiteness by saying that for any finite subset, for any finite set A, for any alphabet set A, if you look at the space of all configuration and you look at the so-called periodic configuration, so periodic configuration is a configuration whose uh, <clears throat> stabilizer are of finite index in G, okay? So a configuration whose uh, stabilizer is a, a finite index subgroup in G is called a periodic configuration. So G is residually finite if and only if the periodic configuration are dense in the configuration space with respect to the prodiscrete topology, okay? And therefore, <clears throat> you look at the... <clears throat> and, um, a cellular automaton must uh, map a, a, um, a periodic configuration into periodic configurations. The period, which is essentially the index of the subgroup of the stabilizer cannot increase and so on. And then you realize that periodic configuration maps map onto um, the periodic configuration if the cellular automaton is injective and therefore by density it must be the cellular automaton must be subjective okay so this is in two lines the proof of this result by Lawton another class of groups which satisfy which are surjunctive is the class of amenable groups this can be proved by an entropic arguments. It is also a consequence of the so-called Gardenovidian theorem for amenable groups, 
which is also a, a proved by means of entropic arguments. So I don't give here the details, but this is uh, indeed the case. And then there is the celebrated theorem of uh, due to Misha Gromov and uh, Benji Weiss, which, which extends this class of examples. Indeed, both residual finiteness and amenability are generalization of, of finiteness and sophicity. So this is the, the largest class which contains the previous ones also uh, is contained in the class of surjunctive groups. So let me remind you what is a sophic group, just in case you are interested. Um, a group is sophic if the following holds. So whenever you, you fix a finite subset in G and a positive epsilon, then you can find a finite set F and the map phi from G into the symmetric group of F, so the set of all bijective maps of F into itself, such that, now let me remind you what is the humming distance on the symmetric group. So if you take two, two permutations, sigma one and sigma two, how can you measure their distance? This is done in terms of the humming distance. So you take, you, this is a normalization of the set of points at which the, the two um, permutations differ, okay? So clearly, if they don't differ, this set is empty and you have zero. So the distance of two uh, equal uh, permutation is clearly zero. Otherwise, I repeat this formula here defines a distance uh, the so-called humming distance. The more are the set of points of your set F where the permutations differ, the larger is the their humming distance. Okay, so I said we have this map phi from G into the symmetric group uh, over the set F such that it is, as I said, is called a K epsilon quasi homomorphism. You see, if you have a homomorphism, you have that phi of the product, phi of k1 of k2, should be the product of the phi's, phi of k1, phi of k2. But this is not indeed a homomorphism, but it, it is close. What, close in what sense? That if you look only at the elements of k, well, to be a homomorphism should be for all elements in G. But you will just restrict this condition to elements of k, and then, you, we don't ask that they are exactly the same, but we ask, these are elements in the symmetry group over F, we ask that their humming distance is small, and small is measured by this epsilon, okay? So this is the first condition. And the second condition is required to have tri trivialities. You could send everything to the trivial permutation, and then it would be a perfect um, homomorphism. No. So we require that if k1 and k2 are elements in k, but they are distinct, then their images by phi, so the two corresponding permutations, are uh, far away. So they differ in a large, uh, on a large subset of f. And this means that their humming distance is close to one. Okay. So the, the celebrated theorem of Gromov and Weiss states that every Sophi group is surjunctive. Okay, let's move to the next section. Okay, now I want to, to introduce the notion of linear subshift and linear cellular automata. Well, I guess you can imagine what is the idea. So now the alphabet A is a vector space, which I call it V, over some field K. Okay, now the configuration space V power G, of course, has the pro discrete uniform structure, the G shift, but in addition has a natural structure of a vector space over K, yeah? the, product, uh, the product of vector spaces. Okay, moreover, the G shift is a K linear map. Okay, if you have X and you map into GX, this map is K linear. Okay. 
Okay, now a subshift, so a gene variant and closed uh, subset of the configuration space VG, which is also a vector subspace. We have to preserve all, also the the this algebraic structure being a vector subspace is called a linear subshift. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we are interested in linear subshift of finite type. Okay, I can we can use the previous definition, but it is just a simple observation that okay, D is as I said is a memory, so it's a finite subset of G, which suffices to control the configurations belonging to sigma. But then the set that before was denoted just by P, the set of admissible patterns. So is a set of patterns with support D over the alphabet V. Now you can take it as a subspace. Hmm? So it's convenient. It's, it's a simple observation that you can take it as a subspace. So you have this expression here. Similarly, a cellular automaton, so a map from the configuration space V power G to V power G, which is additionally k linear. Hmm? Remember, v power g is a vector space, so it makes sense to ask for a map to be linear, k linear, is called a linear cellular automaton. Okay, and this is equivalent whenever you look at the definition by the uh, the, the memory and the local defining map, the associated local defining map mu, to require that the local defining map mu being k linear. Okay. Then we denote by LCA, linear cellular automata, over the group G and the alphabet V, and I repeat, V is a vector space, the set of all linear cellular automata from V power G to V power G. And this time, it's not difficult to see, not in the, in the previous case, it was just a monoid, but here, because we have also this structure over the field K is more interesting, AK algebra. In fact, in fact, if you are interested in the structure of this algebra, this is nothing is uh, isomorphic to uh, the group ring of the endomorphisms of V, the, uh, of the endomorphisms of V, and the, over the group G. Okay, and, and this will be interesting in our um, further discussion. If V is of finite dimension, if the vector space V of, is of finite dimension, I'll call it D, then it is isomorphic to the D by D matrices with coefficients in the group ring, K of G. Group ring or group algebra, if you want, if you prefer this definition, notation. Let me also introduce this notation. V square bracket of G is the subset is subspace of V power G consisting of all configurations with finite support. The support of a configuration is the set of points in the group such that when you evaluate the map X, the configuration at uh, X at the group element G, the vector which you obtain is an element of V is not the zero vector. Okay, so V square bracket of G is so it's, it's, it reminds you of the of the group ring, but this is more general. Is the is this uh, subspace of the configuration space? Okay, so I conclude this old um, the, the the presentation of this old result with Michel Cornard from Strasbourg. We proved the 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 linear analog of the gromov weiss surjunctivity theorem. Namely, that if G is a Sophie group, then it is L surjunctive. What it means, L surjunctive, that every injective linear cellular automaton, tau from V power G, V power G, where the space V has finite dimension, then it is necessarily surjective, okay? It is exactly the same, the categorical analog of the gromov weiss theorem, you re we replace a finite set, alphabet set A, 
by a finite dimensional vector space and a cellular automaton by a linear cellular automaton. So we have a slight change of the category. Okay. And from this result, we could deduce another proof of a result established slightly earlier by Gabor Elek and Andre Zabo. Sabo. They used uh, completely different methods for Neumann dimension and other tools to prove that all Sophie groups have stably finite uh, group ring or group algebra. This is a conjecture going back to Kaplansky. So let me remind you that a ring is called directly finite if the following holds. Whenever you have the product of two elements, A, B, which is equal to the identity of the ring, then also the product in the reverse order, namely B, A, must equal the identity of the group ring, okay? And more, diff more generally, R, the ring, is said to be stably finite if you, if you tensor with the matrices. Uh, so if you have the, um, the matrices, D by D matrices over R is directly finite for every uh, integer D larger or equal than one, okay? So the conjecture by Kaplansky is uh, the, <clears throat> the, group, the group ring of any group is stably finite. This conjecture is still open in full generality, but uh, for Sophie groups, it was proved by indeed uh, Gabor Elek and Andre Sabo, and we deduce it as a corollary of our uh, linear surjunctivity theorem. So this is, I, I would like to say, is you know a, a, a connection between uh, symbolic dynamics, so the theory of subshift and cellular automata, and the theory of group rings. We will see something more in the next slides. So now I would like, as as you see, we started for the definition of subshift and um, and cellular automata uh, by general alphabet A. And in the previous slides, we we gave A some additional algebraic structure, namely that of, um, of a vector space. Now I want to show you uh, some other possible generalization, and that is of group shifts. So now A in this first, this is group shifts one. A is a finite group. Hmm? Then you take A to the power G is again the group, is just the, the, the Cartesian product indexed by the elements of the group G of this finite group, okay? Okay, then uh, in particular is a finite set, of course, but additional, it has a structure of a group, okay? Um, now we look at subshifts, sigma, in the configuration space A to the power G, but this time we also ask not only that it is invariant under the G shift and uh, uh, closed in the prodiscrete topology, but we also ask that as a subset is also closed under the group operation. So it is a subgroup. Okay, if this is the case, then we call it a group shift. Okay, so as before for linear subshift, you, you ask that it is closed in the prodiscrete topology and gene variant and closed under the natural linear operation. So it is closed under, um, as, a, as a close as a, as a billion subgroup and closed by multiplication by scalars. Here, you just ask that it's closed as, as a subgroup and then you call it a group shift. Then uh, you can find it in, as an exercise in the famous book by Lind and Marcus, edited by Cambridge, I think it's 1995, an, an invitation to symbolic dynamics and coding, <coughs> which is referred to as the Bible of symbolic dynamics. And then this exercise asks you to prove that any group shift, any group shift is necessarily of finite type. So, you see you, the, this algebraic, additional algebraic structure 
on the subshift gives a sort of rigidity in the sense that this uh, subshift must have this local property. You can recognize the uh, a configuration belonging to sigma just by looking locally how it looks like. Okay, the finite type condition. Now, <clears throat> let me go further. Group shifts two. Now, A, the alphabet, is not just a finite group, but, but more generally is a compact group. So it is equipped with the, um, it's a locally compact, well, in this case, topological group. And as a topological group is compact, huh? as a topological group, topological. So now we forget the prodiscrete um, uh, uniform structure or the prodiscrete topology because we equip the A power G, the set of all configuration, with just with the product topology because the, the space A, this, um, the alphabet A is not given the discrete topology but the compact uh, topology, which inherits from his topological um, group structure, okay? So this is equipped with the product topology and therefore it's a compact group, okay? Again, you consider a subset sigma, which is G invariant and which is closed in this product topology, which is also a subgroup, then it is called a group shift. This is clearly a generalization of the previous one, group shift one, okay? And now this is a definition which was introduced by Bruce Kitchens and Klaus Schmidt in their paper in the Godic Theorem Dynamical System. And they say that G is of Markov type hmm, if whenever A is a compact group, as before, then every subshift group shift sigma containing a power g is necessarily of finite type you have this strong uh, condition of being finite type and in their paper klaus and bruce proved that the free abelian group of rank d is of markov type that is every subshift sigma contained in A to the power ZD, where A is a compact group. This is a group subshift. Then it is of finite type, okay? Later in his book, um, Dynamical Systems of Algebraic Origin, uh, Klaus Schmidt, uh, Prove generalized this previous result by saying that all groups which are polycyclic by finite are of Markov type. Okay, let me remind you that a group is polycyclic if it admits a finite subnormal series whose consecutive quotients are cyclic. Okay, and polycyclic by finite means that a group admits a finite index subgroup, which is polycyclic or equivalently, it admits um, subnormal uh, finite series such that uh, the consecutive quotients are either finite or cyclic. Okay, so now we return to our uh, linear setting. Mm -hmm. And we consider the following definition and, and problem related to it. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> so this is in a recent paper in collaboration with Michel Cornard from Strasbourg and uh, Kien Funk, now in Montreal. <clears throat> so a group G K is a field, we say the G is of K linear Markov type if whenever we K take V, a finite dimensional vector space over K, the alphabet now is a vector, 
vector space, but finite dimensional, then every subshift, every linear subshift, I forgot to write, every linear subshift of V power G is of finite type. This, this is why we call K linear Markov type, okay? And more generally, we say the G is of linear Markov type if it is K linear Markov type for every field K, okay? So we want somehow to, to imitate the previous definition just by looking at, um, at vector spaces. They, they, one should make the following uh, re remarkable observation that here the, the alphabet A is equipped with the compact, the topology, compact topological group structure. And here we have the product topology and which make, turns it into a compact group, okay? So here we return to the pro discrete uniform structure and there is no compactness involved. And this makes our arguments completely different when you miss co uh, uh, the compacity argument. So we cannot argue the same way as uh, Kitchens and Schmidt, and Schmidt, okay? And we want to reach analogous results. Okay, the first one that I present here is um, is a characterization of groups which are of Kellinger Markov type. So let's first look at theorem one. Okay, we we only obtain result for G countable, and this will become clear later. So uh, V is a finite dimensional vector space. So the following are equivalent for a linear subshift sigma contained in V power G. Okay, this characterizes a linear subshift of finite type. Whenever you have a decreasing sequence hmm, of linear subshifts, sigma zero containing sigma one, sigma n, such that their intersection equals sigma, so this starting sigma, then this decreasing sequence eventually stabilizes. That means that there exists n zero such that sigma n is equal to sigma n zero for all n larger or equal than n zero, okay? I repeat, sigma is of finite type whenever you have a sequence, decreasing sequence of linear subjects whose intersection is this linear subject sigma, then it necessarily stabilizes. Okay, okay, and so this gives immediately the following characterization of a, for a group G of being of K linear Markov type. So whenever you, uh, the group is of K linear Markov type, if and only if, whenever you take any finite dimensional vector space over the field K, then every se decreasing sequence of linear subshifts eventually stabilizes, okay? So this should remind you of uh, Artinian properties. Okay. Um, to give you a taste, I state the, 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 the first proposition and the example, just to, make, to let you have a taste of how one works in this setting. So let's let G be finally generated group, be a vector space. Then it is easy to see that if sigma is a linear subshift whose dimension, the dimension, remember sigma is also a linear subspace. So it makes sense to consider its dimension. If its dimension is finite, then sigma is of finite type. That this is more or less clear because if you, if you look at larger and larger uh, finite subsets of G, eventually, when you look at the, the configurations restricted to this larger and larger, the, their dimension should stabilize because they would reach this dimension here. And then this large uh, set on which they realize the dimension should serve as a memory set for the uh, linear subject. And, and in, in, uh, this example here will have an important consequence 
So in general, take G a group, K a field, and consider the set of all constant configurations in K power G. So this is just one dimensional. The space V is just K, is the field itself. And we look at constant configuration. So there, if X of G is equal to a constant element in K, okay? Now, suppose that sigma is a finite type, the set of conf constant configurations, which is just one dimensional, I repeat. So if suppose that it is a finite type, so it it is the, the subshift of finite type with finite uh, memory D. Mm -hmm. And let, so D is finite. So H, we denote by H, the subgroup generated by D. So this is of, uh, clearly a finite, uh, finitely generated subgroup of G. Okay, now consider the two configuration x0 and x1. Constant configuration, the value is always zero, the zero element of the field, and one, the, you, the identity element, the one, the one, the unit element of the field, okay? And now we define a new configuration this way. X of, is the characteristic function of the subgroup H, if you want. So X of G is equal to one if G belongs to the subgroup H and it's zero otherwise, okay? Now, in this argument that I now skip for you because I don't want to be too, um, too long, you can check that the condition for, uh, for the configuration X to belong to Sigma is uh, is satisfied. You see, when you take GX, you take the configuration X, which is defined here, you take any element of the group G, you restrict to your window D, then you see that it coincides either with X1, the constant configuration here, restricted to D, or X0, restricted to D. X0 is this other one. Just because when you when you apply the G shift, you see you have G inverse S. S is a typical element in D and D belongs to H. Huh? H is the subgroup generated by D. So this element here is in H if and only if G does belong to H, okay? So we have what no matter is W, if it belongs to uh, H or not, this restriction is a, as is this is the admissible set of configure of patterns defining sigma so x must be constant because uh, by hypothesis we say sigma is of finite type say sigma is of this form okay this means that x of g is equal in particular to the value at the identity element 1g which is 1 okay because 1g belongs to h okay so x is equal to x1. So we deduce that h is equal to the whole of g because it can never attain the value zero. And now that g is equal to h means that g is generated by d, which was a finite subset. And this means that g is finitely generated. So you see, if you, just looking at constant configurations of dimension one, the fact of being of finite type force the group G of being finitely generated. And we deduce by simple arguments, therefore, that if G is of linear Markov type, then all subgroups of G must be finitely generated. So in the terminology, G is a Noetherian group. Okay, then our second theorem is a characterization of groups which are of k linear Markov type. So we, G is again countable, K is a field, then the group G is of k linear Markov type, that is all um, subshifts of VG, where the dimension of V is finite, is of finite type is equivalent to the condition that the group ring K of G being left Noetherian, okay? 
Okay, so remember ring is left theorem. If every ascending uh, sequence of left ideals eventually stabilizes, okay? Okay, so let me mention the famous result by Philip Hall that every group which is polycyclic by finite for every group which is polycyclic by finite, the, the associated group ring is left Noetherian. So as a corollary to theorem two and Philip Hall's theorem, we immediately deduce our corollary that every group which is polycyclic by finite is of linear Markov type. And let me remind you that the class of polycyclic by finite groups was the same for which G was of Markov type. So where instead of linear, you don't have anything. And it refers to the to compact groups rather than to uh, subspaces, okay? So in the category of um, gr compact groups and here in the category of finite dimensional vector spaces as, as alphabets, okay? So now briefly, the ideas and ingredient of the proofs, there is this sort of duality between the algebra of linear cellular automata and the configuration space, if you take a, a, config, um, a, a cellular automaton tau and x um, configuration, then tau of x is the corresponding configuration. And this map is clearly KB linear. And then we have this, um, this as I said, this duality. If you take a subspace, just a linear subspace in this algebra, you can gamma, you associate gamma perp, which is the intersection. So remember, these are cellular automata, huh? linear cellular automata. So you take the intersection of all the kernels of the cellular automata belonging to gamma. The kernel are the maps are the configuration such that tau of x is equal to zero. So this is the, is the subspace of Vg, and one easily proves that it is a linear subshift. Conversely, if you start from a linear subshift sigma in Vg, then the set of all uh, linear cellular automata whose kernel contains sigma, we call it sigma perp, this is a left ideal. And then this is lemma one. If you take the double perp of a linear subshift, you end up with the linear subshift you started with sigma, okay? And in addition, you have that on the other hand, okay, K of G, there is, uh, I didn't mention, um, you, you, can, you can realize every, every, every element in the group ring yields naturally um, a, a one-dimensional cellular automatons, so with V equal to K. And so if you take any left ideal gamma in the group ring, then gamma perp, this lives in K power G, is a linear subject of finite type. So such that the gamma perp is of finite type, then necessarily gamma is finitely generated, okay? Okay, and so here is the proof of uh, theorem two. So we start, suppose that the group ring is left Noetherian. Let V be a finite dimensional vector space, say of dimension D. As I mentioned, the uh, okay, then the, the D by D matrices with coefficients in the group ring is Noetherian as a left KG module. But then it can, it, it, it realizes as a left Noetherian ring. And since this, these two algebras, the D by D matrices with coefficient in the group ring and the algebra of all linear cellular automata, V has dimension D, eh? are, are isomorphic, then this is left Noetherian. Okay? So now we want to prove that uh, G is of linear Markov type, K linear Markov type. So we take 
a decreasing sequence by theorem one, it suffices to, to show that every decreasing sequence of linear subshift stabilizes. So we take this uh, decreasing sequence, sigma zero, sigma one in Vg, and we, we consider gamma n, so the, the perpendicular of sigma n. So the, these are, uh, <coughs> these are uh, ideals in, uh, in the, in the algebra, in the ring of all linear cellular automata. And since we are taking the perp, this is decreasing, this is ascending. But now because, because uh, this, um, uh, this ring here is left Netherian, this ascending uh, sequence of uh, ideals must stabilize. And therefore we use lemma one, we take the double perp, the sigma n also have to stabilize. And therefore, G is of linear Markov type because this was the characterization in terms of this ascending, descending sequence of line, uh, linear subshifts. Okay, and the converse is uh, simpler. If G is of linear Markov type, we take gamma uh, left ideal in, uh, <clears throat> in the group ring, we take the, um, the perp is a linear su subshift. Since G is of linear Markov type, all linear subshifts are necessarily of finite type. And by lemma two, gamma is finitely generated. Now, to see that every left ideal is finitely generated is equivalent to say, in fact, that it is left Netherian. Okay. And just to complete, we have the following characterization of the class of finitely generated groups, which are of K Markov type. Of course, we can deduce this from the from the property of uh, of, uh, of the corresponding group rings, but we have used the theory, our symbolic dynamical methods, and show that it is closed under subgroups quotients. It is contained in the class of Netherian groups. It's not known whether we have equality. And in particular, it's closed under extension by either finite groups or cyclic groups. Okay? So in the sense, if, you have, you, if your group G admits a normal subgroup, which is of k-linear Markov type, and then the corresponding portion is either a finite group or uh, infinite cyclic group, then the group itself is of collinear Markov type. So this, this fact here gives you an alternative proof that the fact that all polycyclic bifinite groups are of collinear Markov type, just because you recursively apply extensions and you, you obtain all polycyclic bifinite groups. So we deduced this result by using uh, Philip Hall's theorem, but because of this property here, we can, in fact, avoid the Philip Hall theorem. Okay, I think it is, uh, for, for me, it's 10 p.m. For you, it should be six, I guess. No, five, five. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for your attention. All right. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, Julio, for a very interesting talk. Thank, Thank you. Very much. you. Okay, now if there are any questions to the speaker, you're welcome to ask them. So uh, I was curious about your theorem too. I mean, uh, yes. it's strange that uh, you had this left Nasirian condition. So uh, uh, why is there really a difference between left and right there? Or is it some kind of an accident? I mean, is it you see, the problem is that uh, the um, the problem uh, with cellular automata are defined with a specific action. You see, when you, even from the very beginning, hmm? let me see. Ah, uh, so it has to do somehow with the setup uh, with uh, that some. Yes, because you know, the, the action the action of the group on the on the uh, on the configuration space is a left action, and you have, and then cellular automata are uh, you know, th this is the the way they are defined again when you are the so you you don't have the other it's not it's not b 
you understand you it's only you 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 preserve a structure only on the left you don't have a, something which is both left and right like you know even for um Kelly graphs uh, you have the you have a notion of left Kelly graph and right Kelly graph and multiplication by left or right have completely different um, meaning is meaning of, uh, in the in the from the metric point of view so here i would say it's, it's exactly the same we have defined everything i would say on the left and this is why we have to keep everything in this uh, okay. direction this is my feeling I, I i'm i'm sure this is the way because sometime we had troubles when looking with uh, actions on the right and uh, everything was wrong. <laughs> I see. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, I was trying to remember, uh, so in terms of uh, uh, Sophic groups, uh, I mean, it's still a conjecture that everything is Sophic, right? It's all groups of Sophic, uh, as far as you well, know. Okay. It's not known. I, personally, I think that one day some, someone will show up and give a talk at the New York uh, Group Theory Seminar and, and say that there, uh, there is a group which is not Sophic. <laughs> <laughs> You it's believe the class of subjective, even for subjunctive group, there it is not known whether there exist non-subjunctive subjunctive groups. Uh -huh. right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Are there any other questions? All right. Let us thank Tulio again. Thank I you. I thank you for your participation. I hope to see you again. Okay, so I'll stop the recording now. And, uh...